Hi, I'm Tom Sawada from Drummer to the Bone. Uh, today I'm joined by Corey Coverstone. Corey is a session drummer, solo artist, and educator. I don't know if I missed anything there. Uh, he's endorsed by DW Drums, uh, Vincent Drumsticks, and EPad Practice Pads. Corey, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Of course. Glad to be here. Thanks for asking me. Good <laughs> of course. <to> <laughs> So, um, first question that I actually saw on your Instagram a while back. Um, it's like from sitting at the drums for the first time to getting to Modern Drummer. Like Modern Drummer magazine is like one of those places or medias where you go, well, mom, I made it. See, all that noise was had a purpose. Uh, what would you say were, and, and I'm sure that for a lot of drummers, including myself, and I, of course, never made it. Um, being in modern drummer, it's a, it's an actual thing. It's a milestone. So, what would you say were the key things that got you there? Um, and one day you found yourself opening that magazine. Um. Yeah. Well, to me, it, the keys to success have always been. Uh, staying dedicated to the craft, um, having teachers that are good guiding you and putting in the energy and the time to practice the stuff that you need to be working on and just staying focused and trying to become the best drummer and the best musician that you can. And to me, that was always the key to success. Um, so there's that piece of it there's also this element of uh full transparency a lot of times you need a publicist <laughs> to get <into> the <laughs> so uh playing with, you know? playing with dirty honey i mean i think there are special cases if you're like i don't know fill in the blank like absolute virtuoso like redefining how drums are played like once a century type of music then Of course, like maybe the magazines or whoever are going to, they're going to seek you out and just want to feature you because you're so special. Uh, I am not that player. So <laughs> the way it happened for me was, <laughs> yeah, I think trying my best to be the best musician that I could playing in Dirty Honey. We had a publicist, so they're doing their thing and um, just kind of because of that situation, like being in a band that had some exposure and whatever. And um, I think that's pretty much, those were the two <laughs> main elements that I can think of, yeah. And speaking of, well, the publicist part, yeah, I expected that. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> big Wizard of Oz behind all so, of that. Uh, like, don't believe like, everything you see is publicists uh, behind that, but, When you talk about, well, practicing the right things, right? You you, you mentioned that. Yeah. Which, Whatever. yeah. What, what, what do you think are the right things to practice? The right uh, things to focus on? Yeah, your time. I mean, I, whatever, it sounds obvious. And uh, a lot of people talk about that. But I think way fewer people actually execute that and do that in a way that, is helpful is that, <laughs> so you're, if you're hearing this crazy sound right now <laughs> it's not ducks it's actually the garbage truck the gar <laughs> didn't hear a thing so don't worry about it okay cool, so, cool. um so you're talking about time and sounds obvious but for some reason it's not that obvious and you usually find out when you're in their recording studio when you're playing <laughs> Yeah. that's when you find out oh, okay maybe my time is not where it should be right exactly yeah yeah i think uh it require working on your time and your feel requires um more of a it's not just turning on a metronome and playing it's not yeah. that That can maybe help a little bit, but it really takes like dedicated focus and concentration on 
like I like working with a pad or actually just clapping with the metronome because then you're working with a sound that's not like a I don't know maybe your snare drums has longer sound or you know but you're working yeah. with a very staccato sound the metronome is very staccato you can hear exactly where you're putting the sound in relation to the metronome which is presumably perfect time <laughs> if it's a good metronome <laughs> if it's a good metronome yeah right. uh, but yeah i mean I, and I, and doing that like for hours and at specific tempos there's this whole um thing that uh theory i guess that i was taught uh which has to do with my teacher called it tempo gravity and this theory is basically or the idea is basically just that the middle tempos 100 bpm or so are the easiest tempos so you start there and from there the slower tempos and the faster tempos are the harder tempos that you work towards and the tendency with slow tempos is that you want to rush back towards the middle tempos the tendency was fast tempos the tendency with fast tempos is to drag back yeah, towards yeah. Middle tempos. so that's why it calls it tempo gravity towards me medium tempos um so i think if you go about it also in a systematic way of like starting in the middle which is comfortable and branching out you know slowly to these more challenging challenging tempos it's funny to say that because it's the same thing it's, it's an expression of the evenness of time and they're all it's the same <laughs> across the, the same board. yeah for whatever reason yeah faster and slower tempos uh it's just harder to like with slow tempos to broaden your uh conception of that those longer spaces between the pulses anyways it, no, yeah but it also has to do with slower tempos like keeping your balance right just staying focused because you tend to rush and it's, sometimes it's because you're not sitting in the right position. Your your balance is off because you're like trying to anticipate, you know, the next one or or whatever. Uh, so yeah, totally. And the other thing is, well, do you actually practice, you know, like on the beat, behind the beat, in front of the beat? Because that really can change the feeling of, of a song, right? If you get like all like Zeppelin songs or ACDC songs, right. Phil, it's like Phil Rudd is not rushing it. It's, he's like behind the beat a little bit. Right. And that creates that kind of atmosphere, right? Right. Uh, do I practice that? Uh, in in terms of... I do. Um, yeah. I've spent a lot of time working on that stuff and it's, I do it with the metronome clapping. Right. So, you know, I, I practice and that's actually a good clapping intentionally behind the beat, the same distance behind each beat, you know? So if you're flaming behind the click, um, I can just show you, but um, it's actually, or if you're clapping ahead of the click, the same, space each time you're actually still just clapping even time it's just right. in relation to the metronome um and that doing that intentionally behind or ahead is actually a really great way to train your ears to hone in to be more aware to uh play down the middle on the click if you can identify really quickly and accurately a small flam ahead or behind then you can make a quick adjustment to be dead on easier, more easily. Uh, and in terms of, so yeah, I do practice that. And in terms of playing in a band or with a group and like needing to push it or lay back or whatever that, um, if, if I'm in the studio and we're playing to a click, I just try to smash the click. <laughs> I just play down the middle and let the other guys do what they're going to do. And that's it. Um, but if there's not my problem anymore, yeah, I just smash the click. I'm like, that, that's I'm down the middle. Um, and you know, in the studio, like if they want it to lay back a little bit, you can literally just grab the drum track and yeah, you know, just whatever. But... <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I think different people probably have different approaches. They would argue with me on that, but um, it's yours. that's, that's what I do. Yeah. 
but playing live is a different thing. That's where it's a little more fluid and you can push and pull. And it, that just comes from having the, the skill, like you have to practice that stuff to be able to have control over your time and where you're playing your sounds in the music. Um, but it also comes from knowing like what type of music you're playing. If I'm playing like an up-tempo, like jazz thing that's got some attitude to it and the soloist horn player is like going for it, then yeah, maybe I think Tony Williams and I think Lewis Hayes and I like push the time a little bit because that's the music. That's what that genre is. And vice versa, like you said, ACDC, like the, so it comes from listening and knowing what you're doing, what the music you're playing is and how the other players play. Like everybody feels the time in their own way a little bit. So, you know, Justin with Dirty Honey, for example, was notorious for playing so far behind the beat. And that is a different ex playing experience and mindset for me than, uh, I don't know, playing with, I don't know, some other bass player <laughs> that <laughs> was down the middle or something, you know? Yeah, someone who's like very like, for example, like those very technical or very like Steve Billman. Right. Guy, Steve Billman. Fucking awesome bass player. <laughs> and um going to another thing that uh, I've seen in a lot of forums and a lot of places ask and and pre probably the answer is pretty simple, but I don't know. What are the keys to get an endorsement? Because I know that 90% of drummers want an endorsement of some sort. So yeah. for drum gear, uh, what was your path to that? Was there a path to? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there in music, there with everything, endorsements included, that there's many paths and it's not just one way to go about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was the same way when I was young and first starting out. My, I was like telling my teacher, I'm like, how do I get endorsements? I want, do I just mess <laughs> And like send him a CD or like what do I do and he was like you gotta have a gig like you have to it's a business not I mean it's uh, like when I was a kid I always thought like it's all about the skill and the whatever you just I didn't know what I thought it was about I guess I was just naive but like um yeah you have to like it, everything it's a business so like companies want their products to be seen by audiences. If you don't have an audience, then like they might not, but then there's the flip side of that. If you're like a virtuoso, like redefining how the instrument's played, then maybe that's your path. Or maybe you're, uh, I don't know, a super successful educator and that's your path. Like there are different facets. My experience was I am not a virtuoso um so I didn't have that I wasn't like a super established educator or something uh didn't particularly have a huge following so there was no real reason for these companies to like want to hand over their products at a discount or for free or anything like so it took playing with Dirty Honey and being you know in a somewhat successful band for a few years and then like um what was the exact path for me with DW. DW was our tour manager at the time, knew Garrison or some knew somebody that or knew the the um the EU rep whose name is uh not coming to my mind right now. And they just kind of connected and said, hey, I'm playing with this band, Dirty Honey. We just opened for The Who in Michigan and uh we'd love for you guys to meet. Or maybe it was before that. I don't know. It was just, you know, the business people connecting dots, introducing me and and then Garrison, uh the one of the artist relations people at DW came to the show that we in Grand Rapids where we opened for the Who. And you know, we met there, small talk and kept in touch and then I don't know, a few weeks later just emails they're like, "Hey, yeah, so here's our offer. We'll offer you the entry level, whatever bronze tier <laughs> DW thing. And then with Vincent, uh, Vincent Sticks, uh, that's 
we met in I met Ludwig, the artist relations guy in Sweden at a festival. He approached me backstage and I actually needed sticks because we were it was a crazy schedule like the bus. I don't even know if we had the bus at that show or what the situation was, but we were flying to do one off festivals and dates and then linking back up with our gear and renting. It was crazy. So I think at that show, I actually didn't have sticks. So he gave me a pair of Vincent sticks and I was like, Oh, what the hell are these? And it was the, um, what's the guy's name? Mickey D Mickey D the drummer for the scorpions. Yeah. Motorhead (laughs) and yeah. Yeah. It was his signature stick. I was like, okay. I play with two B's usually. So I'm like, you need like fucking, do you have any two B's? But those were, they felt really good. Like right off the bat, I was pretty impressed. And, um, then yeah, we just kept in touch, and I think he, I think he reached back out to me at the beginning of this year, and uh, asked if you know I'd be interested in trying some samples, and I tried a bunch of their products and found that the five B, do I have one here? They have like a white five B that it's kind of tacky. I like that, and uh, yeah, so that's how that worked out. E pad practice pads that was uh which my computer is stacked on top of two of them right now uh that was through my first serious teacher mentor nate morton he plays drums with um we play drums with everybody but he plays on the voice the tv show yeah um yeah he introduced me to ed who owns the company and um just kind of put in a good word for me so yeah i guess there's like you know, different paths, like, I think ultimately, like, you just have to be doing stuff, you know, for the companies to want to yeah, be- publicly be out there, have exposure, have it's people. A big part of it. And it, it, I don't know, to me, it's kind of like, oh, man, like capitalism, damn, like, it's kind of a bummer, but it's kind of true. But that doesn't mean you can't have like a great relationship with these companies like i am fortunate to have and blah 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 so you've mentioned um the who too transparent (laughs) Uh, (laughs) love it that's what we're looking for um so you mentioned the who but you open for bands like guns and roses kiss uh black crowds so besides the obvious size of these bands and but in terms of how they conduct themselves on tour, where I guess you you met them, uh, their professionalism, what would you say you took away from those experiences? What, which, like elements or behaviors, do you take away from those? As like, uh huh, that's how the you know big bands do it, the big artists do it. Yeah, interesting. Um... Well, they all do it a little differently (laughs) in what I've seen. Guns N' Roses, for example, I mean, they're fucking huge. So they have (laughs) like intense security and like, you know, we we were also opening for them kind of around COVID and there's still all that protocol Mm -hmm. and stuff. And, you know, they wanted to be like very, uh, I, I guess, by the books or careful about covid protocol so i don't know they were very during that time my experience with them was very strict i would say for example and then on the contrary with kiss we have played a couple shows in europe with them and that was like the most relaxed just didn't give a fuck like if we were in their dressing room area walking around like what it, it was just totally like just a bunch of guys hanging out. <laughs> um, Black Crows were kind of similar. Uh, just very relaxed. I guess, like, what did I take away from it? I don't know what I took away from it. It was just, I don't know if I took anything away from it, per Ooh. se. But it was interesting to see, you know, and I definitely... I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what else to comment that's... on that, but that's a good 
<laughs> That's okay. So, um, two more questions. Um, so we don't take too much of your time. So, question number one has to do with composition, you know, composing. So you have two solo records, a, a full-fledged record, a human a human experience, and then an EP, uh, Punch, Punch the Shaman, both yeah. on Spotify. I actually love them. Um, yes. So the question to you is, how did you approach composition? Because I know um, some of them have standards, but then you have your own music. So did you start at the drums or did you start at any other instrument or maybe singing to something or melodies? Yeah, the a human experience was, yeah, like you said, basically playing standards. Uh, and so I didn't really have to compose anything. Um, I did have a lot of ideas, though, that I wanted to try with the band, you know, those records that I was playing along to at the time and, you know, learning the tunes of sometimes different recordings would have different, uh, you know, the, the musicians is jazz, right? So it's kind of free and they would yeah. get into different vibes. And I was like, that vibe's cool. What if we made mm -hmm. that a little vamp for a drum solo at the end? So that was kind of almost like more producer mindset, I would say, than composing mindset for a human experience. And then it was just getting in the studio and like trying stuff with the live band. And um, yeah, so that was basically just standards with a little bit of producing. Punch the Shaman, yeah, I wrote everything and for that um i it was a lot of with a midi keyboard in ableton having a distorted guitar sound or a distorted road sound or like a crazy bass and um just experimenting and like writing a little bass line or coming up with a little chord progression and thinking that sounds cool all right let me copy paste that oh what if that and then it's just in Ableton, it's so easy to have your little MIDI clips and like drag them around and cut and paste. And then you create a whole new thing by accident or whatever. And once <laughs> the shaman, it was a lot of that. Um, and I actually did like, I think I did like eight tunes. And then I decided that I only wanted to release three of them. But a, a lot of it also was presenting kind of the blueprint that I had. I MIDI demoed everything for Punch the Shaman. And what you hear on the record is a lot of uh, the musicians that I hired, it's their embellishment and it's their take on it. So they added a lot of very nice, in my opinion, colors and uh, tasty bits. Beautiful. And um, do you have a favorite or preferred mic setup? Like condensers on the far corners, of the room or or something like that is do you have a go-to setup in terms of mics uh, when, when you're recording in, in well i mean if i'm in a studio situation and i'm being brought into somebody else's studio yeah in the I, studio i don't have a say <laughs> at all <laughs> okay it's whatever they like maybe you know on the second dirty honey record um <laughs> i kind of commented like oh sm58 on the hi-hat huh like interesting thinking like that's probably not what have i what i would have reached for but uh that's what they the producer liked and that's what the engineer liked and it worked and it's whatever so yeah in the studio i don't have a say but in my little drum studio where i do tracks for people um i mean i i do i experiment with um you know spaced pair overheads condensers that's always nice lately i've been doing the uh is it x y or yeah the... yeah on, on top yeah, of it. yeah basically and then i have a little mono mic uh ribbon mic as a mono overhead mic pretty basic honestly just everything's close mic and then i have a room mic um i i will say that because of working with Nick Didia, um on the second Dirty Honey record, he had, well, I think on the first Dirty on the EP too, he mic'd the toms top and bottom, which 
I always kind of thought like was unnecessary the bottom tom mic like what is that capturing it's just more ring and like mud uh but if you blend it right with the top mic and obviously get the phase aligned you have to invert the phase of the bottom mic but um it sounds nice it's like adds a lot of beef to the tom so that's become kind of a go-to setup for me is top and bottom tom mics blending Beautiful. that thing. awesome all right Corey. so i don't want to take too much of your time we've been like 45 minutes in total um so how can people reach out to you uh you give online lessons i don't know if you give in-person lessons and recordings so how um drummers or other people can find yeah, you. if you want to reach out I, I teach online i teach privately uh if you're in the los angeles area you can reach out to me either through my website ccdrumlessons.com send me a message i'll get right back to you you can reach out to me at Corey coverstone on instagram and facebook um yeah yeah so you can contact me <laughs> Corey, thank you so, so much for your time. This has been fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Have a beautiful day, everybody. Thank you, Corey.